so much for coming. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. All right. Let's get started with some quick questions. Who of you knows about the Clippy project? Who knew about the Clippy project yesterday? All right, all right. That's still a very good number. Thank you so much. OK. So first things first, hi, I'm Pascal. I do Rust since 2014. And if you ever happen to be in Cologne, please try to be there on, a, on the first Wednesday of a month, because we do great Rust meetups. You can also follow me on Twitter. And I write some stuff in my blog about Rust as well, so you might want to check that out too. But let's start with something that absolutely uh, everyone can agree with, that Rust programmers like compiler errors. <laughs> yeah? I'm pretty sure that every one of you has seen a compiler error once in his or her lifetime, and you said to yourself, wow, this is, this is really great. I want to have more of those. This is Basically, what it looks, uh, it looks like, it might be a bit small, but it's a very nice error format. And this is something that delivers the promise of, of Rust safety, because the compiler is there to, to help you check your stuff. So you can be confident that your code actually works. Also, the errors are pretty. And it's not just errors, it's warnings too. Like, we have a warning that you have not used the result of a function. Like, if you have a result type and you did not check it was an error, if, it was an error if, if it's of any use, the compiler will tell you. This is not something that breaks your code. It's just something that points you in the direction of maybe a mistake you made, so your code gets even better. And, and my absolutely favorite lint of all is missing documentation. If you're publishing a library and you activate this lint, it tells you which public items have no documentation. This is not just so you can write documentation, but it's also very, very helpful to figure out which items are actually public and which items you did not want to be public and wanted to change later on and maybe he published a breaking change. So it's very, very useful for that. And about two-thirds of you said you knew about Clippy, just for the other ones. Clippy is awesome. You should totally look it up. It's a collection of even more lints. So if you like the, the built-in errors, you can get even more errors. Like yesterday, there were 208 additional lints. I'm pretty sure if you check in next week, there'll be 210 or 12 or so, something like that. And it goes more into the case of catching even more mistakes that you may have missed. For example, if you wrote an if and else and both code blocks do the same, it's probably a mistake on your part and you just copy pasted it from the if to the else and forgot to check it later on and fix it. Clippy has a lint for that as well. It's, it's, very, very it's, it's an ambitious project and it's very, very awesome. Okay. A completely other aspect of, of lints and warnings is that you don't just want to catch warnings, but you also want to learn about new things. For example, I hope you can read it, otherwise I'll just read it out loud to you. So you have an iterator, and you call the filter method on it, and you give it a closure where you compare the item that you are iterating over with zero, and then the result of that you call next on. So basically, you have an iterator, you get the next item that contains the number zero. Hmm. It's an interesting way to, to write that. What, what did you actually mean when you wrote that? It's, it could be anything. It could be just a check for if, is there any item that is zero? Why not find the item? And then you actually have explicitly stated in your code that you wanted to find an item that is zero. Or that's, that's a trivial example. Let's go for something more. It's an if statement that if the map M does not contain the key K, you insert K with the value V into M. OK. That's all good. It's like how you 
insert stuff into a hash map in basically every language. But Rust can help you with that in a way that may be surprising, but will lead to very good code. Have you heard the good news about the entry API? If you use dot entry instead of contains key and then insert, you will do the hashing only once. You ask the map, is there an entry with the, that maps to K? And if it's not there, you can insert it. This is very concise and very much not if then do stuff. So you might not have even noticed that there is such an API. And there's a link to tell you about it. And afterwards, you'll be a bit more experienced in the crazy APIs that Rust standard library has to offer. So these lens help you when you're basically almost using an API that you didn't know about. And if you happen to be bored some lazy afternoon, you can also just check the Clippy documentation because it has examples for basically every lint with, okay, this is what you wrote, and this is what you maybe have meant, and this is what you could also write. It's a good read. I can recommend it. Okay, okay. So I don't know how many of you were there from Matthias' talk earlier uh, this morning. He talked about idiomatic rust, and man, he, he told you all about how to do it yourself. It's, 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 a, it's a nice idea to actually fix your code yourself, but how about we make this a bit more interactive, okay? So the compiler already gives you suggestions. If you wrote for i in 10.0, you're iterating over something that's never happening because ranges only work in the one direction and not counting downwards. So you were looking for something that's called a reverse loop. Basically, you wanted to say 0 dot dot 10 and then reverse it. You didn't know about it? Okay, it's totally fine. I didn't know about it either. Um, but the lint didn't just tell you, okay, here you can do this. No, no, the lint actually wrote the code you need to write to get good idiomatic code. So why fix it yourself? This is from your perspective, I hope. It's totally from my, my perspective. The quote on the slides, if you can't read it, says, OK, I'm sold. These suggestions are great, but I don't make me type, don't make me wait, and just fix my freaking code already. Enter Rust fix. So there is no magic, and it's already happening. You've seen the errors, you've seen the suggestions. The error messages and the diagnostics can also be outputted as JSON instead of human readable text. So let's just take this JSON and pass the suggestions and do a bit of search and replace and you end up with better code. A at least I hope you do. It's actually, if you think about it, really trivial. And so the Rust fix there's a tool that's called Rustfix, and it's a simple CLI tool. You basically invoke it, and it calls the compiler and asks, hey, what do you say about this code? And for every single error message you would have gotten from the compiler, Rustfix collects the errors and shows you one by one, hey, so this is wrong, or we can do better here. Would you like me to replace it with da 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 and you say, yeah, sure, or nah, I don't know, or this is plain wrong. It's, it's all in there. And after you ran through all these errors, you say save, and it basically replaces the things you've thought, uh, told it to replace in your code. And hopefully your code still compiles, and it works better than before. Big promises, I know. Uh, but it's still not like we can, we can do better. Like you need to manually call this tool. Like that's one step too many. Okay, okay. What's better than like writing code and calling the compiler and making it tell us stuff and basically wrapping Rust fix around it? Well, obviously, 
let's do it in the editor. While we are typing, we want to have suggestions as well. And luckily for us, people have already been working on that as well. It's called the Rust language server, and it exposes warnings, errors, suggestions uh, to an editor that can consume the language server, uh, the language server protocol. The most complete plugin for an editor is the one for a Visual Studio Code. And turns out it can already fix our suggestions. So basically, why did we write a CLI to it? Just use this plugin. And so it turns out, where's Clippy in this? Like, the Rust language server doesn't know about Clippy. Why don't we make it know about Clippy? And I had a horrible, horrible hack that basically imported lints from Clippy into the Rust compiler that gets called by LS, and it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. It really wasn't pretty. So I was very glad to see an email just this morning about, hmm, why not add Clippy as an optional feature to the Rust language server? So thanks to Oliver, who's here with us and whose talk is the one after mine, and you should totally stay for it. Uh, Clippy is now an optional feature in the Rust language server. And also five internet points for Nick Cameron. Uh, this is already merged. <laughs> Not released, but, but merged. So if you're going to compile RLS yourself, uh, you'll get this awesome bunch of additional lints. So this is the time where I'll give you a demo. Well, I don't, I, I don't have my laptop, but <laughs> that's no problem. I expected to not have my laptop because, well, I mean, it was too easy. So let's do a quick slideshow. This is what it looks like. You open Visual Studio Code and basically write these lines. Just enable basic Clippy warnings, write a main function, define a vector with the element that's the number one, and write an if statement that says, hmm, what's the length of, is this length of the vector greater than zero? Hmm. What would you actually want to do here? Hmm. Length comparison to zero. That's a nice, that's a nice overlay. But also, see, there's a light bulb. OK. Yeah, let's fix it and replace this if length gra uh, greater zero with is not empty, because that's what we actually wanted to express. And also, this is more performant, because collections, ca uh, collections that are not as trivial as vector can basically implement is empty in a more efficient way than counting their elements. OK, so we get a nice light bulb, we get a nice context menu, and we can apply it, and bam, it's done. The applause, is not, the applause is absolutely not for me. Like, I hope the people who actually made this work are here or watching the stream sometime in the future. And this applause was for you. OK, time for another demo. You wrote a NIF statement with a small Boolean expression. Just imagine it was like twice as long and not just something I came up with this morning. Uh, it can be simplified. To what? Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Less than or equal, sure. We knew about that. Let's fix it. Damn. Another thing done. But it's not all good. Like, it's not all finished. It's not, this is not 1.0 or anything near it. And I want, what I want you to take away from this is you can contribute. This is a very nice lint that tells you that if you wanted to write 3.14, you may have actually wanted to write the constant for pi. So why not use like the constant that's actually defined? OK, wait, where's our light bulb? There is, there is no light bulb because this suggestion does not exist. It's, it's only zero message. OK, OK. So this was a demo. Thank you so much. I'm glad it works as well. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a bit about how this 
actually works. Like, not the zero lines of code I committed, just how it actually is working. And lints are compiler plugins, basically. And if you've been here for the talk before mine, um, Nikita talked about ASTs, and lints basically are matches on particular AST structures. You try to find nodes and items of interest, and then you tell the compiler to basically annotate this piece of code with a suggestion or a help text or a warning or what have you. And the compiler then generates output that's either human-readable, as you've seen before, or machine-readable, so Rustfix can consume it. This is not that hard as you, uh, like, this is actually rather trivial. I managed to do it. So if you wanted to look at some code and say, hey, hmm, maybe, maybe I can, can actually fix this myself manually or by writing a lint, you should totally not fix it yourself because everyone can do that. <laughs> Write a lint. We have a very interesting question still open, though, because what is actually autofixable? Like, we have these suggestions, and can we apply all of them? Is, is everything we get good code that we can just search and replace? Yeah, a lot of it is, actually. Like, I was surprised that I expected it to like be a very, very small percentage of all suggestions we have that we could actually auto-apply, but it turns out we can auto-fix a lot. We should totally make a list. Or actually, how about we flag approximate suggestions so we know which ones are not auto-fixable? And when I wrote these slides earlier last week, there was not was a PR open for the Rust compiler, this glorious uh, pull request number 47,540 that acts as a simple flag to each suggestion you write and passes this down to basically the JSON output as well. And it allows you to flag approximate suggestions. Yeah, I was going to talk about how this is a good idea and how we could maybe do it, but actually, eh, it, it got merged already, so just <laughs> this stuff is changing rapidly. Like, if you, if you look at this talk in a year, I hope you'll already, already be using it, and everything I tell you will be totally unsurprising. So, yeah, it's great progress that's happening here, and you should all contribute to it. And with that, thank you so much. And, and to recap, just so I can leave the slide here, search for Rust Clippy, search for their good first issues, and become a compiler hacker. <laughs> yeah, let's start here and then go there. Yeah. Okay, something I just wanted to explain maybe. Um, I know there's some reason that you can or can't use parts of Clippy on stable or require nightly. Could you explain? The deal there. Uh, Clippy is basically a compiler plugin, as all lints are, so it would be very, very hard to stabilize the compiler's internal APIs and not have them break ever. So we don't want to do that. But actually, Clippy will be shipped with Rust up as a component you can install, just like Rust format or the RLS, so you don't have to. So you can, I think it's in, in the next release, or maybe in the, the one after that, that you can just write Rust up component at Clippy and get it on stable. Just go there. I have exactly the same question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Have you thought about a solution for fixes that introduce new errors? So the question was if I have thought about fixes that introduce new errors. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of suggestions are not yet, they, they introduce maybe not errors, but, but new suggestions. And this is a good case. Like, we're already producing code that compiles, but tr triggers new errors. And yeah, it's, it's, you could get 
into the way of thinking that like, okay, let's just recursively run Rustfix uh, <laughs> until it generates no more errors or it doesn't compile it. This is, this is a good solution, but not one that's, that's working um, quite as we intended it to. So I have, I have no solution to give you except for calling it multiple times, but I'll be open to, to any suggestions. Any more questions? Yeah, sure. This tweet is more than enough to detect that you are assigning the size of a, a vector to a local variable and then comparing it with zero. Maybe. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to say yes, but maybe. <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. But yeah, it's like. Do you want to do that? Uh. Okay. Okay. We still have time for more questions, I guess. That's, that's actually the secret be behind all my GitHub contributions in the last year. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. I've, I've run it on, on personal code. I have seen people run it on their code, but I have not yet started like doing pull requests automated by Rustfix. <laughs> it might, might be a good idea, actually, but um, you should totally look into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the question was if I have tried or uh, if I intended Rustfix to be a tool that can upgrade code, basically. So once new Rust features become available, that you can uh, use Rustfix to upgrade your code base to use them. And I totally didn't think about this until there was a discussion about introducing epochs to the epochs, or whatever they are called actually, uh, into Rust. Because this year, the, the Rust team wants to basically compile a new version of the Rust language itself and introduce breaking changes without breaking code. And they want to do that by actually versioning the compiler and the standard library in epochs. So, if you wanted to have async and await as a keyword in, in random code, this was, this was actually proposed, uh, it would not work today because you can't introduce new keywords because people might already be using this for their variable names. And epochs will solve this because in your cargo configuration file you say, okay, let's use Rust version 2018 instead of the implicit 2015 one. That's 1.0. And in this discussion, um, people started talking about, well, can we make all these changes in a way that they can be auto-applicable with Rustfix? And I was like, yes, <laughs> please, please do it. And if and there are some lines in Clippy that suggest using newer features or features that were not available in 1.0, so there's already a bit of precedence for it. And I would be really happy to have a Rust fix that you can tell to load the lint groups that's called upgrade to 2018 and get your code fixed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.